What's going on, family? I'm Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fistigov Series. Now, I want to continue to examine 100 years of the greatest 150 black fighters of all times. But I want to take a look at Ray Robinson. Now, we've looked at Ray Robinson several times on this platform. But I want to look at Ray Robinson's progression and to see what kind of an impact he had in the welterweight and middleweight division. And you'll be shocked. Now, Ray Robinson was born May 3rd. Now, he was really born in 1923 as Walker Smith. But under Ray Robinson, they have him listed as 1920. They also have him listed as Alley, Georgia, where he was born. And being relocated to Detroit, Michigan. Now the thing with Ray Robinson. Well we'll just call him Walker Smith at this point of his life. He would help carry the bags. The gym bag for Joe Lewis to Brewster Center. Because he lived a block away from Brewster Center. And the reason why Ray Robinson would carry the gym bag. For Joe Lewis. Into the gymnasium. It's because Joe Lewis was supposed to be going to his violin lessons. And it was a street that Joe Lewis had to cross. Where his neighbor, who lived across the street from his mother's house, would spot him with that gym bag. And spot him going into the gymnasium with a gym bag. So he would have Ray Robinson, who idolized Joe Lewis. Meet him on a corner. And Ray Robinson would grab Joe Lewis's gym bag and walk it into the gymnasium for him. And it was at that point in time. Now, Ray Robinson, once again, Walker Smith, was a young man. But he began to like the environment of boxing. He would watch Joe Lewis hit the bag several times, but he couldn't stay in the gym. He was too young at that time. But the door was always open, and he would stand on the corner there, and he could look into the gym and see Joe Lewis hitting a heavy bag. He would also watch Homan Williams and others that were in that gym. Now, meanwhile, Ray Robinson would then move to Harlem, New York. Once again, he was Walker Smith at this point in conversation. And he would hang around the Salem Crescent Club, was a church on a corner. And Harry Wiley Sr., who was a former YMCA boxer, would run the gymnasium in the Salem Crescent Club. And it was an opportunity for young boys to get off the streets and just learn how to box more of a recreational thing than anything else at that time. And Ray Robinson, who once again was Walker Smith at that time, would show some progression. And Harry Wiley Sr. wasn't working with Ray Robinson at the time. You had a man by the name of Pee Wee Beal. And Pee Wee Beal was a co-trainer to Henry Armstrong, who was Melly Jackson at that time. And Al Savani was the co-trainer for Henry Armstrong, who once again was Melly Jackson at that time. And in 1932, Melly Jackson, who was Henry Armstrong, would try out for the Olympic Games. And it was at that point he would meet Harry Wiley Sr. Because Harry Wiley Sr. was the head trainer for the Los Angeles games in 1932. And Henry Armstrong didn't make the team because of his style. But you would have Lou Salica and others who would make that team. So Harry Wiley Sr. was introduced to Walker Smith. And he kind of liked what he saw. And he would be placed in tournaments, local tournaments in the neighborhood. So when Pee Wee Beal introduced Walker Smith 
to Harry Wiley Sr. He then came on board as a team along with Soldier Jones and Harry Wiley Sr. And that would, that's what would make up the team for Ray Robinson, who at the time was still Walker Smith. So in 1937, Ray Robinson would continue with tournaments, but in 1938, he wanted to fight the big guys because he was knocking everybody out in those local tournaments. And he found out that the top prize was a jewel watch. And you can win that watch and sell it for $10. And that was a lot of money at that time. So Walker Smith wanted to enter the AAU. National tournaments. But one problem he would have. He would be too young. He was 15 years old at that time. And Harry Wiley just kind of blew him off and told him. Nah you're too young young man. You have to be 18 years old. So he found a solution. There was a young man that used to hang on the corner all the time, but he would hang around that church because he was familiar with the church. He used to train there. And his name was Ray Robinson. And Ray would complain to, well, Walker Smith would complain to Ray Robinson about his situation. And Ray Robinson, spoke to Harry Wiley Sr. And Ray Robinson would say to Harry Wiley Sr., he wants to fight in a tournament. Why don't you just give him my card? I'm not coming back here to fight anymore. I'm just here working out and shadow boxing around. So they thought about it. And Harry Wiley Sr. slept on it, and the next day he said, all right, let's try it. So they would enter Walker Smith as Ray Robinson. And the new Ray Robinson, who had two prior losses as Walker Smith, would now be undefeated under Ray Robinson. His record would be 85-0 and 0, with 69 knockouts, with 40 of them in the very first round. And Ray Robinson would win the 1938 Metropolitan Bantamweight Championship belt. That had not been done. Now, they have him listed as 18. Mind you, he was 15 at that time. So then he would win the open class. Never fought as a novice. Went directly to the open class. Daily news competition and the Golden Gloves. And he would win that tournament against a stable mate of his. His name was Louis Spider Valentine. Now, Eddie Mead, I'm sorry, uh, Pee Wee Beald. Eddie Mead was a trainer for Henry Armstrong. And he also managed Henry Armstrong, as well as Barney Ross. But Pee Wee Beald would work with Louis Spider, Spider Valentine. And so now, there was somewhat of a clash between Harry Wiley Sr. and Pee Wee Beal. So Louis Spider Valentine and Ray Robinson would mix it up in the 1939 Golden Gloves Finals. And Robinson would defeat Spider Valentine. So the following year, Ray Robinson would enter the lightweight division. And he would win the lightweight Golden Glove competition against Andy Nunelli. Now he faced Andy Nunelli and the Chicago Golden Gloves. He had a big name at that time, did Andy Nunelli. But what Louis Spider Valentine would do with Eddie Mead, with uh, keep saying Eddie Mead, with um, Pee Wee Beal, is that he would stay at the featherweight division. He didn't go up to lightweight with Ray Robinson. He stayed at featherweight and he would win the featherweight 1940 Golden Gloves. Now Ray Robinson 
as I stated, would turn professional October 4th, 1940, on the undercard of Fitzy Zivic and Henry Armstrong. And 50% of the members in that audience came to see Ray Robinson because they knew he was a special young man. They couldn't wait to see how he would look in his debut. So Ray was invited back when Armstrong would lose to Fizzy Zivic and he would come back in 41 for his return match with Zivic. Ray was invited back to fight on the undercard once again. And this time, Henry Armstrong would be stopped in 12 rounds. He would be exhausted, he would be busted up because Fitzy Zivic knew the tricks of the trade, somewhat of a Bernard Hopkins. He would hit you on the opposite side of the referee. He would use his elbows, he would use his thumb because at that time he had thumbless gloves. Well, he had thumb gloves and he would poke his thumb in the eye and the throat and everything else. So Henry Armstrong would lose that fight. And when they brought Henry Armstrong back to the dressing room, Ray Robinson would go over to the dressing room of Henry Armstrong and he told his idol, don't worry champ, you're still a champ to me and I will get revenge over Fritzy Zivic. So Ray would do that very thing. Probably within that year, he would be the main event at Madison Square Garden in defeating Fritzy Zivic. <laughs> now in 1941 Ray Robinson was so popular after that victory that he would become ranked number one in the lightweight division and at that point you had Sammy Angot who was the champion and Sammy Angot who retired twice will be a two-time lightweight champion. Got out of defending his title against Ray Robinson because the New York sack had Ray Robinson's record as if he was 19 years old. He turned 19 in 1940. But in 41, they still had him listed as 19. And the New York sack didn't recognize a 19-year-old fighting for a title. This is the same problem Black Bill had against Midget Wargas for the flyweight championship belt. So what they did was they wind up fighting anyway, but it would be for a non-title affair because Ray Robinson, as a 19-year-old, under the New York sack, would be a six-rounder. They would consider him a six-rounder. So he faced Sammy Ingott in a non-title affair, and they both came in weighing 136 and a half pounds. Now in 1942, Ray Robinson would now be ranked number one as a welterweight. And the problem there, Freddie Redcock Crane refused to face Ray Robinson. And so Marty Servo, who, by the way, Freddie Redcock Crane had defeated Fizzy Zivic and took his title. So that's how Freddie Redcock Crane would become the welterweight champion of the world. So Marty Servo would then become the welterweight champion. But then the war would come into play. Now, meanwhile, as the title was frozen, Charlie Burley and his camp approached Ray Robinson and George Gangford, who was the manager of Ray Robinson, and wanted a shot at Ray Robinson. Robinson wasn't champion yet. He was ranked number one, still as a lightweight, and he was ranked number one as a welterweight. So he said to the camp, why would I fight you if I'm ranked number one in both, and you're ranked number five in a welterweight division? And at this point in time, Charlie Burley had defeated Coco Kid 1938 for the Colored Welterweight Championship belt. So that brought him down to rank number three. 
And you had Fritzy Zivic ranked number two. And number one, you had Severino Garcia. Henry Armstrong, who was the welterweight champion back in 38, had defeated Severino Garcia. And that's how Fritzy Zivic would make it to number one. But in 39, Ernie Rudrick would get a shot. And so, instead of Charlie Burley. So if anything, Henry Armstrong has slightly avoided Charlie Burley. And that was more Eddie Meade. Because they wanted Henry Armstrong to get another shot with Barney Ross. Because Barney Ross had threatened to retire. So, in 1942, as Ray Robinson was ranked number one, Philly Redcock claimed, didn't defend his title because the title was frozen. So it wasn't until 1946. Ray Robinson would finally get an opportunity and why would he get that opportunity? Was because Rocky Graziano had punished Marty Servo, busted his nose. Marty Servo refused to face Ray Robinson because Ray Robinson had dusted him off twice before he also defeated Tommy Bell did Ray Robinson so there were stipulations in everyone else's contract for Ray Robinson and the State Athletic Commission and the National Boxing Association wouldn't go for that so they took rank number 7 Tommy Bell and gave him the opportunity to face Ray Robinson. And as I stated, Ray Robinson had already defeated Tommy Bell earlier that year. And Ray Robinson had a scare where he was knocked through the ropes for a 19 count against a hard puncher in Cleveland named Artie Levine. Now, Artie Levine was from Brooklyn, New York. And I met Artie Levine, he told me that story personally told me all the details and in speaking with Artie Levine I could hear in his voice the frustration but he never showed any animosity he admired Ray Robinson told me nothing but good things about Ray Robinson when I spoke with Artie Levine but when Ray Robinson would face Tommy Bell <clears throat> Tommy Bell was ranked number seven. He was out of Ohio. Had a brother by the name of Bobby Bell. It was actually three brothers. And Ray would be dropped in the sixth round. My grandfather was at Madison Square Garden December of 1946 when that fight happened. I believe it was on the 25th of December. And he told me you couldn't hear a pin drop. As they used to say, you couldn't hear a rat piss on cotton. The theater was completely quiet. And all you heard, after Ray Robinson on one knee, would look at his corner at Harry Wiley Sr. And Harry Wiley Sr. just gave him a stare. And Ray and Harry had a chemistry where Ray knew what was on the mind of Harry Wiley Sr. And when he got up, as my grandfather would explain to me, the tap dance in sound of the shuffling of the feet of Ray Robinson, just dancing around that ring, popping the jab, shooting the hook, moving his head from side to side, clearing his head, turning Tommy Bell. And when Bell would get him close to the ropes, he would grab Bell around his shoulders and wrap his arm around the other arm of Tommy Bell and he would walk him to the middle of the ring. When the referee came in, he would shove him and he would dance again. And he would become the welterweight champion 
of the world. Now, Ray Robinson would have a few defenses of that welterweight championship strap. His last title defense, 1950, would be against Charlie Fuseri. He was in New Jersey. And the referee for that fight was a trainer of mine. His name was Paul Cavalier. R.I.P. to him. Now, Paul had a brother by the name of Art Cavalier. He had Ace Marotta. He had several members of main events in that gym. It was called Lenny Shaw's Boxing Gym. And Paul told me the story. He told me the story about Ray Robinson and Charlie Fuseri. And Marcel Sedan and Tony Zell. Rocky Graziano and Zell. Told me all those stories. He refereed those fights. And Charlie Fuseri was from New Jersey. He was really originally from Sicily. But he was a very good fighter. Very, very good fighter with Charlie Fuseri. And the fight went the distance. And Ray would win, but he would move up to the middleweight division. Now, you hadn't been fighting for that title. Yeah, Charlie Fuseri and a young man from Chicago. His name was Johnny Bratton. Called him the honey boy. In fact, I did a profile on him in the other video. And Johnny Bratton would defeat Charlie Fuseri and he would become the welterweight champion of the world. And then he would lose his title to Kid Gabalon. Now, the referee his name was Ruby Goldstein. He would stop the contest because Johnny Bratton would be fighting Kid Gavilan with a broken jaw. Meanwhile, Ray Robinson, as he moved up, he would take on Robert Villamain and he would win a Pennsylvania. It was a vacant title. Middleweight championship belt. But then he would get his shot at a familiar face his name was the Bronx Bull, Jake Lamada. And these men would fight a total of six times. They fought in 42. Robinson would win. They would fight in 43. Robinson would get be thrown out of the ropes. They fought six weeks later. I'm sorry, they fought three weeks later in 1943. And a rematch. In between that, Robinson would face California Jackie Wilson. And Robinson would defeat Jake LaMotta. And his third time facing him. Three weeks after he lost to him the first time. In the same 1943. He would fight him in 45. But 1951... It was called the St. Louis Day Massacre. And Ray Robinson would become the middleweight champion of the world. Now, June 16, 1949, Jake LaMotta would stop Marcel Sedan. Fought him a big stadium in Detroit. And he would win the title. Because Marcel Sedan didn't answer the 10th round. He claimed he had a soldier injury. And what was so questionable about that fight was that Jake LaMotta would take on Blackjack Billy Fox and Jake LaMotta, Joe LaMotta stayed on Jake to take a dive. His word on the street was that Joe LaMotta owed the mob close to $20,000. And that's what would be paid to Jake if he were to take that dive because the money would be split because most people would assume that Jake would win that fight. So Jake LaMotta never went down, but he allowed himself to be beat to a point where the referee would stop the fight. Now, the reason why that Jake LaMotta and Marcel Sedan fight was questionable was because the same $20,000 that Jake LaMotta would receive he would bet it on himself in that Marcel Sedan fight. And then Marcel Sedan turns around and he does not answer the 10th round. 
and on the return, his plane crashes. So all of a sudden, there would be no rematch with Jake Amad and Marcel Sedan. That was questioned. So eventually, in the 1960s, Jake LaMotta would have to, he was called in to the New York State Athletic Commission's office and they had a, a trial and he would start spilling the beans about what really happened. He would open up a nightclub, but he couldn't fight in New York anymore. That's why he was fighting in Chicago and others. So Ray Robinson, February 14th, 1951, to knock out Jake LaMotta in 13 rounds. The fight took place in Chicago Stadium. Ray Robinson would now become the middleweight champion of the world. July 10th, 1951. He would lose his crown. To Randy Turpin, 15 rounds. Lost to him in England. And this really crushed Ray Robinson because Ray Robinson was living a life over in England. And... He had everybody over there, chauffeur, a midget. He had suitcases and suitcases of suits and furs and everything for his wife. And his head wasn't in the game. Ray Robinson had faced Randy Turpin in his seventh fight in that tour. But on September 12, 1951, Ray would stop Randy Turpin in 10 rounds. And he would re win the middleweight championship belt in the New York Polo Grounds. And Ruby Goldstein, who I met and spoke with, lived on Cherry Street in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Had a friend by the name of Teddy who lived across the street from him. And he knew him. And he had him over one day, and Ruby Goldstein told me this personally. That Dr. Vincent Nardiato, who was the chief physician that night in the state of New York to begin with and he told Ruby Goldstein Ray I need you to go over and do what you need to do what he was saying to Ruby Goldstein I need you to go talk to Ray because if I go over there and talk to him the state athletic commission is going to make me stop this fight so Ruby Goldstein went over to the corner and as he was talking to Ray Harry Wiley Sr. jumped in and said, Harry, give me another round. Soldier Jones will take care of this. If you can't handle it, then you do what you have to do. And that's how Ray would jump on Randy Turpin and knock him out. That's the champion. December 18, 1952. Ray Robinson would retire. Because he went to New York's Yankee Stadium. And he tried to win the light heavyweight championship belt from Joey Maxim. He couldn't answer the 14th round because of the heat. Ruby Goldstein had to be replaced by a young man by the name of Ray Miller. Ray Miller was from Chicago. One of the most vicious punches that would come out of Chicago. He was a lightweight. And in fact, Ray Miller would be the same referee that would speak the uh, State Athletic Commission, excuse me, about Willie Pep and Sandy Sala. And that's why Willie Pep's license was revoked because of the conversation that Ray Miller would have with the State Athletic Commission concerning Willie Pep. So after Ray would lose to Joey Maxim, he would then retire. What was supposed to happen was that Ray Robinson was supposed to win the light heavyweight championship of the world and he was supposed to take on Davy Sands who was the Australian light heavyweight champion and they were supposed to meet each other but unfortunately for Davy Sands he was one of five brothers and two of his brothers was with him and they had a little business going and their truck overturned in a ditch. Davy Sands was pinned under the truck and he would die. Davy Sands would defeat Carl Bobo Olsen twice. It was a hell of a fighter was Davy Sands. One of the best Australian fighters of all times. My grandfather was around during that time and he knew all the stories about what was happening. And that's the story he gave me. 
and that didn't work out. So Ray Robinson would retire. He would come back in 1955 after da- tap dancing in show business. And he needed the money, so he would come back in 55. And his second fight would be against Ralph Tiger Jones. Ralph Tiger Jones was in Yonkers, New York. That's where he lived. And he would give Ray Robinson the business. And Ray Robinson would lose to Ralph Tiger Jones. Scrapbook Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fist of Series. Let's do a part two to this video. Ray Robinson, impact the welterweight middleweight division. 100 years, the greatest 150 black fighters of all times.